Okay, today's a lecture on the autonomic nervous system. It's a nervous system lecture. And I placed this one here because some of the cranial nerves we'll study, which is the next lecture, have autonomic functions. And so just to remind you of the organization of the nervous system, we have this slide. The peripheral nervous system is broken down into sensory and motor. So autonomic is part of the motor division. And there's two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic division. So two sets of nerves. And they have different structure and function, although they're both a part of autonomic. Well, simply put, they refer to as um, the parasympathetic those nerves just associated with the word anabolic. That means tissue building. So think rest and digest, you know, like, like the man is illustrating, laying down, resting. You eat a meal, you go to bed, you rest, and your body digests the food and stores the calories, right? Or burns them. Rest and digest, anabolic. It's kind of like the default. It's always on. Or you could have a rare situation where you're in a fight or flight mode where the sympathetic kicks in, adrenaline. Or we say it's fight or flight. And we really do mean fight or flight one or the other, kind of an instinctive reaction. Um, I can remember watching this uh, prank show where they had a hidden camera and people walking down the hall and someone would pop out of a box and scare people. And it was funny to watch, most people would be scared, kind of cower back, but every once in a while, one person would react by punching the guy in the face. So it's kind of like most people are a flight, like this guy is doing, running away from the snake. Some people just react by attacking. Uh, but anyways, this is a very high stress situation. Um, sympathetic system, it, it really increases metabolic strength very quickly for an emergency. The only other way you increase strength is by resistance training, to hypertrophy the muscle. <clears throat> And so, you know, think adrenaline and think, you know, this kind of situation. Hopefully this um, isn't used very much, but it happens. Things happen in life, and we have the sympathetics to deal with. Now, to, to do a side-by-side -side comparison of um, somatic versus autonomic, the efferent nerves are different, so we want you to see that. Let me get my here. somatic nervous system, then we have autonomic. The thing that I wanted you to notice from this is, well, first for somatic, we talked about that already. All those nerves that I taught for like when we studied upper limb and lower limb, for example, and you had to know the names of the nerves, like musculocutaneous innervates Oh, yeah, coracle brachialis and biceps brachii brachialis, you know, or the ulnar nerve innervates flexor carpi ulnaris. That kind of memorization, that is the somatic nervous system innervating skeletal muscle. So all of those um, nerves, the command begins in the primary motor cortex right there. So it's voluntary movement. command is 
issued from primary motor cortex. And um, we've talked about this before, and we said that there's an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Upper, lower, motor neuron. You know, there's only one nerve that actually leaves the central nervous system, this black one, to innervate the muscle. So only one nerve fiber here. Okay, and the other one's within the spinal cord in the brain. Now, the autonomics are different. The commands are issued mostly, primarily from the um, hypothalamus. So we call it visceral motor, not somatic motor. More or less, it's involuntary. And it's called visceral motor as opposed to somatic motor. That's the term you use. And the command is primarily issued from hypothalamus. And what you can see there, there's a neuron from the hypothalamus but then there are two efferent neurons. Okay, there's a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. So you have a neuron in the CNS, the purple one on the figure, but then there's a preganglionic neuron as well as a postganglionic neuron. So those three all together, but the one we really pay attention to is this one, this one, the pre and the post. Now the reason why we call them ganglionics is because you have two neurons that need to synapse in the body. They are outside the protection of the central nervous system. So they need an encapsulated structure called a ganglion. On the picture, it's illustrated here. Just where the two cells communicate, right here. It's external to the central nervous system, so they kind of have to um, synapse inside that structure. Um, whereas that's not necessary for the somatic nervous system because there is no synapse. You don't synapse until you get to the target. Okay. So the postganglionics are the cells that will actually innervate and stimulate the targets. And the targets are different. For the somatic nervous system, it's basically skeletal muscle. Target skeletal muscle. However, for autonomics, you can see a variety of things there. Basically, smooth muscle. Uh, glands, cardiac muscle, so smooth and cardiac muscle, and glands, generally speaking. Which glands? Sweat, uh, tear glands, basically it. So let's follow that up with a more detailed picture uh, shown here. That still compares autonomic to somatic, but also compares parasympathetic to sympathetic. Okay, so it's a little more nuanced.
So what you see at the top there is um, they just show the neurons in detail. And um, they kind of, it's a nice table. I, I, I think it's a good overview. And um, well, the first one is the somatic motor system. And you have to like think how we've been talking about the nervous system throughout the course, not just all at once. You know, you had a lecture on the ash potential in neuro tissue. Well, that was lecture exam four. But we also had a lecture on the brain. We also had a lecture on the spinal cord. And those are all, well, you still need to have that knowledge in this lecture. For example, there's the cell body of a motor neuron. Okay, and if you recall, it's located in the ventral horn of the gray matter in the spinal cord. I don't know if you remember that. Remember when I would kind of like draw a cross section of the spinal cord, central canal, and I did the butterfly shaped gray matter in the middle? Actually, I drew a lateral one too. Let me do that. Quick review the cell body of the somatic motor neuron is here. Right? And this sends its axon out the uh, ventral root there. Okay? So you still have to know that. Where are the cell bodies of the visceral motor ones? Well, not the ventral horn. What other horns are there? There's only two others. There's dorsal and there's lateral. Anyone remember? Lateral. A lateral horn contains the cell bodies for visceral motor. Yeah, so I'm glad I did that. It's hard to remember some details like that. So I'll put another cell there. So that's a visceral motor. Okay, and it goes out the, you know, it's still located inside the spinal cord there. And that's why they say, up there it says, cell bodies and central nervous system. And then the axons kind of leave, and this is kind of what I want to go over. So again, visceral motor, somatic motor. Yeah. So for somatic motor, it looks like they have the cell body illustrated, and they have a long axon. And it looks like there is um, quite a bit of myelination. Heavily myelinated. They illustrate a lot. And they secrete the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We abbreviated ACH. We just got through saying it, it targets and makes muscle contract. And they say it's stimulatory. And what we had said was muscles do one thing. They contract. They shorten. And the nerve always makes the muscle contract. That rule was always true. Uh, okay, well, oh, the, the um, autonomic system is a little different. So first they have the sympathetic. These two um, efferent models, they kind of are illustrating the sympathetic nervous system. So I'll put SYM for short, sympathetic. For the first cell, the cell body located in the lateral horn of the spinal cord, the axon is relatively short. It's going to leave the spinal cord and go a short distance to a ganglion. Stay right there. And they're lightly myelinated. There's not a whole lot of myelin on there. 
When it gets there, it'll synapse inside a ganglion into a postganglionic cell. So this dotted circle represents a ganglion. Here's a, here's a postganglionic cell in there. It receives a signal. The chemical is still acetylcholine. That is how the preganglionic stimulates the postganglionic cell. So here's a pre. That one. This one's synapse inside the ganglion. It's a post. So consider where the synapse occurs. It's a ganglion. Just a cluster of cell bodies where the synapse is occurring. Now look at the axon of the post. Um, it's a little longer because it's got to go all the way to a target. So I'll illustrate it being much longer. And there's um, basically no myelination. And norepinephrine is the uh, neurotransmitter that will stimulate any of these targets. So the chemical that's secreted. NE stands for um, norepinephrine. Targets are different. Basically, we, we call it viscera, which means contents or organs. So differences already, we have a pre and a post cell, whereas here we only have one. The first one's a little bit shorter, the second one's a little bit longer in terms of the axon length. You know, there's an exception in the sympathetic nervous system that's very important. We have sympathetics that are preganglionic cells. preganglionic cell, it's going to send its axon all the way to a structure called the adrenal gland, specifically the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is located in the kidneys, okay, which is right here, my 12th rib. And, um, anyways, the gland is, it's just a gland. There's an inside part and an outside part. You know, the inside part, the pithy part, is the medulla. Keep seeing that word medulla. Medulla means pith, center. Okay. Well, anyways, that's what you want to target. This cell sends its axon all the way to it. It never synapses to another one. It's like this is like the second cell. Well, it happens to be a gland. Send its axon all the way. Okay, and it's still lightly myelinated. I'll, I'll just illustrate some myelin at the end there. It's, the point is, well, you see if you're with, is this a pre or post cell? Pre, it's pre all the way. Synapses right there, stimulates. And the gland will secrete, it'll pump adrenaline into the bloodstream directly. That's what glands do. Or at least ones that have endocrine function. So here I'll draw a blood vessel, a little capillary. Um, the two chief uh, secretions are epi and nor epi. E and N E. So E and E are both secreted. So how about I'll draw blue balls and green balls to represent E and N E. Adrenaline. Talk more about it in uh, 431. The, these are the, sometimes a, a word is used to describe epi and nor epi. Let's see. Epinephrine. Books usually abbreviated E and E. It used to be called adrenaline, nor adrenaline, so now we call it epi. Epinephrine nor epinephrine. Uh, th these are the chemicals that, during a sympathetic response, give you strength. 
okay, and energy. The parasympathetics have a pre and a post. The, first, the pre ganglionic cell uh, travels a long way to get to the ganglion. Parasympathetic. Here's the preganglionic cell in the central nervous system. The first one's relatively short. Okay, it's lightly myelinated. Second cell. Oh, I'm sorry. First one's relatively long. Jeez, come on. Come on. All right. First one's long. Which are really long. All right, lightly myelinated, second one short. Here's the post inside a ganglion, second one short, so it gets to the target. First one long, second one short, but you still have the pre-post arrangement thing. Pre, post, target. Uh, in terms of the Transmitter, neurotransmitter, it's ACH that both cells use to communicate as a neurotransmitter. So I'll draw a little blue balls to symbolize ACH for the pre and the post. In preparing for this lecture, I've decided that the next four slides, don't worry about them. Just cross them out. These terms I used to teach them, um, cholinergic, adrenergic, and you, you can look at it yourself if you want. Uh, it's more for like drug interactions. I don't really teach that. You can take muscarinic and I forget I'm not going to do it. Uh, this one. I kind of taught this. I'm just not using the terms muscarinic or adrenergic. We're referring to the type of receptors that utilize uh, ACH nor epinephrine, but it um, just gets a little confusing. However, I should say um, those terms do come up, maybe when you study the pharmaceutical drugs, and so it, it may pertain to you, and they're tabled out nicely in Marriott, so I think you might have to know that in the future. You can use Marriott as a reference for those terms. I think for this lecture, I'll stick to what I've taught here and what's presented here. So now we have a general idea of how the nerves are organized, called neuroanatomy. You need to kind of know where the sympathetic efferents and the parasympathetic efferents, where they come off of the central nervous system. So what we see here is that the parasympathetic, colored purple on the figure, they come out the central nervous system either in the brain, brain stem, or down here in the sacral region. So that's why the term cranial sacral is used. Parasympathetic. Cranial sacral. The term thoracal lumbar is used. Because the spinal nerves 
come off the level of um, T1 to L2, okay? So these are referring to spinal nerves, not vertebra. For cranial sacral, there are actually four cranial nerves that have parasympathetic function, I'll go over them. And there are um, sacral spinal nerve, nerves S2 through S4. Four cranial nerves, as well as S2 through S4, and that's your parasympathetic function. That's what the figure is illustrating here for you. Okay? So basically, top and bottom for the parasympathetic, and it's kind of right in the middle for sympathetics. Here's a picture of a ganglion, just to show you that they really do exist. Um, I'm not going to test you on this, but generally, I point to like the fibers, the axons, and all the cell bodies in there. There are many synapses occurring in a ganglion. You need a protective space that's encapsulated, you know, a safe place for a cell-to-cell -cell communication. They occur in the ganglia. And we will learn different ones here. So I'll, I'll, let's cover the parasympathetic division first. It's, it's a little easier to map out in terms of the neuroanatomy. So here, these are the kinds of figures presented in books um, that illustrate parasympathetic function to your visceral organs. Okay. And I have there S2 through 4. And those are the four cranial nerves that have parasympathetic function. You might as well know them. 3, 7, 9, and 10. Okay? okay this kind of shows the cranial part. I'll just kind of illustrate disproportionately the central nervous system, brain stem, spinal cord, just to illustrate. Well, anyways, here's, here's the four cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, and ten. Okay, they're, they're basically at the base of the brain. And, uh, well, the general pattern of what you see is <clears throat> the preganglionic is kind of a darker purple, and the postganglionic is a faded out purple. That's kind of what they're illustrating there. Uh, the first uh, cell is a little bit longer, so I'll just kind of draw the cell body in the central nervous system, and I'll draw the first one a little bit longer, and the second one is a little bit shorter to the target. And you have a ganglion somewhere. So this is parasympathetic function. That's how the cells are arranged. And look at all the targets that can have visceral function. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to teach each cranial nerve, nerve by nerve, so now I'll just kind of overview and uh, simplify a little bit. They show a picture of the eye, specifically uh, the gland, the lacrimal gland, okay, well, both eye and gland have parasympathetic function. The reason they, they say eye for eyeball is one of the parasympathetic functions is to help uh, focus your lens. Called oh, close vision. I'll, I'll explain the mechanism later. You know, reading a book. You just put something in front of you. Oh, okay. And as you get older, you have to like hold it farther and farther back because the lens gets a little, well, I'll explain it later. But anyways, that's parasympathetic function to help focus your lens. Also, the lacrimal gland produces tears. So I'll say cries, you know, tear production. Uh, I'd say nasal mucosa, you know, get the sniffles. I would say more importantly what we teach are these, this right here. Um, that's salivation. Salivates. These are visceral motor functions. 
parotid gland is another salivary gland. That's a, so we got three salivary glands there. Heart. Um, this will kind of like slow the heart rate down. And for lungs, it'll bronchoconstrict the airways. Not to the point of you're asthmatic, but as opposed to bronchodilate. So decrease heart rate. Um, bronchoconstrict. Well, let's look at the, uh, the, the bottom half, the, the sacral part, as two through four. However, notice that cranial nerve 10, it's the longest one, and it gets all of this viscera. So, in terms of liver, parasympathetic, parasympathetic function, well, um, get more bile produced. That's why they show the gallbladder there, because the gallbladder helps uh, store bile. For stomach, um, you, you basically increase the uh, stomach motility. So I think what you can say in general for all of these uh, digestive viscera Increased function for digestion. Uh, for the sacral spinal nerves down there, I'll just draw a cell down here to illustrate S2 through S4. <coughs> First one long, second one short. So what's down there? You got your urinary bladder, your ureters. The parasympathetic function on the urinary bladder is to help you go, avoid bladder. They show the genitalia, the, the vagina and the penis. Um, parasympathetic function is sex arousal. So there's an old saying in anatomy, S234 keeps your penis off the floor. Just to help you remember that. <coughs> sympathetic function is different though. Okay, well anyway, sympathetic function is a little more complicated than how the neuroanatomy is. Um, so I'm gonna erase all of this and talk about the sympathetic nerves. Sympathetic function is T1 to L2, the thoracolumbar lumbar regions. There's a lot of variation here. There's another structure you gotta know. So for the top part, they illustrate T1 to T4. Let me draw this a little wider so I can draw that. So T1, T2, T3, T4, spinal nerve level. So the cell body is in the central nervous system, and the first one is short. So I'll draw T1 going out a short distance here. The reason why it's shorter is it actually, um, I think of it as like an elevator system. Because you're right in the middle, T1 to L2 you need to enter a ganglion right there. And that ganglion is part of a chain of ganglions. Individually, you would call that one ganglion because you have one on either side here. They call it paravertebral because you flank the vertebra. So call this one para 
vertebral ganglion. However, there's a ganglion at each level, and they're all connected. So as a whole, you would call them sympathetic chain ganglion, the whole chain. So I would write that term down. The paravertebral ganglion is just a link in the chain. I'll say part of a sympathetic chain ganglion. So what, one possibility of the neuroanatomy is the preganglionic, this cell, it enters the chain, it enters the paravertebral ganglion. And it synapses at that level, and the post goes to the target. There's the post. A little bit longer. Target over here, whatever the target is. Okay, so one possibility of how the nerves work. I'll just say the pre for the preganglionic. Um, it enters. sympathetic chain at a level, in this case it's level 1, T1, and synapses at that level, and the postganglionic goes to the target. one possibility. Think where T1 is. Where is rib 1? What is it attached to? What part of the sternum? It's manubrium. You can feel that. That's T1. But what if you have to go sympathetic activity up to here? Well, you better have some higher up ganglion. So let's draw some going up there. Okay. So another possibility is you can have a nerve fiber. I'll use a different color to illustrate. Um, maybe it's coming off. Maybe it enters the chain, but does not synapse, and it goes up to the elevator, up the elevator, so to speak. Maybe it synapses here at this top level, and then maybe the post goes to the target, to like the eye, it's higher or something. All right, so that's another possibility. pre-ganglionic neuron it enters at a level, you know, the sympathetic chain, does not synapse, it ascends up the chain, ascends up the sympathetic chain. Then synapses. Then the postganglionic cell goes to the target. Post goes to target. You could go down the chain too, if you want. That's another possibility. The point is you can go up or down that chain to get to some higher or some lower level. Okay. All right, so that's another possibility. Um, you know, a third possibility can happen if you get below the level of T5. But before I uh, advance the slide, do you have any questions on number one and number two here? And let me show you the, the sympathetic function of the structures that they show there. I'm going to erase this.
by uh, basically pupil dilation. So sympathetic and parasympathetic oppose each other. I didn't write this down for parasympathetic. But that having been said, what's the opposite of pupil dilation? Constriction. That's what parasympathetic does. Yeah. Um, hmm, what else are you going to teach you? Oh, well, they show a slab of skin. Sweating is a sympathetic response. to um, gland production, so I'm not going to write anything, usually inhibited. In terms of heart and lungs, this is what sympathetic does best. It bronchodilates, to increase airflow to the lungs, and it gets your heart rate going. Increase heart rate, bronchodilate, that means open up airways. You can deliver more fresh air to the lungs. Okay, so um, there are some other possibilities when you get to T5 and below. It goes all the way to you know the L2. I, I don't want to draw them all in there, but there are some differences here. You still have part of the chain down there. Right, goes all the way down to L2. However, to get to some of the viscera, um, another possibility is call it number three, because I had one, two before. Let me illustrate it first. So at the level of T5 or below, this possibility can occur. You can kind of like the preganglionic cell, the orange dot, that's the cell. It sends its axon. It can enter the chain and do nothing. It just goes through it at that level. And it goes to some other ganglion, these ones here. Uh, these are called, generally, we call them prevertebral ganglion. Um, let me write the term here. Actually, I don't think it's hyphenated, it's just one word prevertebral. And they are the celiac ganglion, the superior mesenteric ganglion, inferior mesenteric ganglion. Those are the ones. They include celiac ganglion, superior mesenteric ganglion, inferior mesentery, ganglion, pre-vertebral ganglion. I'll put a star next to that. And in my illustration here, the pre-vertebral ganglion Synapse inside there, and then the postganglionic will go to the target. All right, so let's kind of write that out what happened. So, the 
good ganglionic neuron. enters the chain, does not synapse, passes through, passes through. Yeah, because you don't want to synapse to the post to get close to the target. Yeah, because the viscera are kind of down here, further away from this, so. Yeah. Passes through. enters a pre-vertebral ganglion. Then synapses. Then I'll draw, all right, post ganglion, it goes to the visceral target. goes to the visceral target, you know, like intestines or something like that, like they show there. So usually books will present those three, and they'll stop there. But there's actually a fourth one that's kind of an exception. There's only one visceral target that just has the pre that goes all the way to it. I already taught it. It's the drill, yeah, the drill, the drill medulla. Very good. So um, pretend you have an adrenal medulla here somewhere. I guess a fourth possibility is again just below the level of T5. Draw another cell. Okay, pretend you have a cell. And uh, it enters the, per, uh, the paravertebral ganglion. It goes through. It enters the prevertebral ganglion. It doesn't synapse. It goes through. It goes all the way. It stays pre all the way, all the way to adrenal medulla. So if you want to write that out as like a fourth, go ahead, it's never synapses. That is illustrated on the figure, just point it out, just for the medulla. Right here. Boom. Notice how this fiber stays dark green. Remember on the figure, dark green is preganglionic. So it's preganglionic all the way. The other thing you gotta know is this term here, the splank link nerves. Here and here. So these nerves have names. So on my illustration, splank link nerve would be like these guys. Okay. Okay, so let's go through the sympathetic function for what's illustrated there. First, any questions on what I wrote here for number three or for the exception, adrenal medulla? Okay, as if there weren't enough terms already, let me give you one more. Sometimes books like to call the prevertebral ganglion collateral ganglia. It's another term you may come across on one of my slides. I tend to stick with prevertebral, but I'll throw it up there just to make sure you, you've been told. Okay, that's all. All right, so uh, the function
they picture liver, gallbladder, well, you're not digesting food in a fight or flight response, so you really inhibit the gallbladder, but for the liver, you want to increase the glucose output for energy. Increase glucose. Get some glucose in the blood. You know, for digestive organs like the stomach, you really want to inhibit anything and everything digestive. Inhibit digestion. And what you want to do, um, contract sphincters, right? They show spleen. You know, spleen has a capsule, but that's unusual. The capsule has a, a, a smooth muscle layer. For a sympathetic response, you kind of like want to squeeze blood out of the spleen. I think that's why they show spleen. Obviously, squeeze blood. And mobilize the blood there. Uh, let's see what else they show. Well, they show the um, genitalia below. For the urinary bladder, the sympathetic response is to help you hold it in, right? Remember, parasympathetic was void. Sympathetic, hold it in. Urinary bladder, hold it in. I put air quotes, I say hold it in. Books usually say storage reflexes. You know, for men um, and women, it causes contractions during the sex response. Um, for men, in particular, it causes ejaculation. So parasympathetic was erection, um, but sympathetic was ejaculation. So just remember, point and shoot, right? PNS, parasympathetic erection. Sympathetic ejaculation. So it is different there. Yeah. There are other things that's um, important that you have different nerves for that because during ejaculation, um, the sphincter for the bladder will constrict to keep urine in the bladder so it doesn't share the urethra with the semen, which will not be good for reproductive purposes. So I have some slides to help go over those three pathways of innervation that we um, kind of mapped out here. Number one, enter the chain, go up. Number two, go enter the chain, synapse at the same level, go through. And number three, go through the paravertebral, but then synapse in the prevertebral. Okay. And so kind of, as you look at your notes, um, kind of like use these figures to help you study it when you're at home. So this figure is very nice, and what I would do as exercise, since you're required to know all of this, is to name every anatomical structure that the cell takes along its path, okay? This one is this first example where you just enter the chain, synapse, and the postganglion goes out, okay? But there's a lot of anatomy here. So you're looking at a slice of spinal cord and notice this, the cell body of the preganglionic, it starts in the lateral horn. Before we get into this, I think this is a good time for a break. Uh, come back at around 9.10.